All right. I think we're live. <laughs> so I'm I'm not just creeping today. I'm not trying to hide anything. This is so I can draw. Hopefully you'll be able to see it. And if not, just act like you can. Uh, I'm renovating my office, so it, it's a mess, but that's that's normal for me. It's how I roll. So today we are talking about deploying a home-based, well, not just home, a sim in a lab. And I say not just home because maybe it's an enterprise lab at work for multiple people, but maybe it's just for you at home. And is that really practical? So feel free to join along. I am monitoring the comments. Um, so if you have any opinions, I'd love to hear them. Um, I, I'm just going to start off and just kind of summarize my answer. And then we'll spend the rest of the conversation going through and breaking apart that answer. So let's, 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 let's just jump to the end and then we'll start back at the beginning and act like I didn't do that. <laughs> so is a sim in a lab, even for something like home-based, does that actually make sense nowadays? Because there's a lot of moving parts. Well, my answer to that is, no, no surprise, yes. <laughs> I think it's easier now than it has ever been in all of my years. Technology's gotten easier to implement. There's a lot of moving parts, but there's a lot of blog articles. There's a lot of uh, YouTube videos. There's a lot of like, there's just tons of stuff. And is it easy to implement? No. But man, you learn a tremendous amount deploying sim at home. And in fact, I would actually state that I know people who have more enterprise grade home labs that are sim than many businesses that I partner with. Well, maybe not you know, after I partner with them, but before. <laughs> so you just learn so much from doing this. Now, there, there's a lot of differences in how you go about doing this. So let me just start by, let, let's break down like some of the components. And then I'm also gonna talk through like some of the implementations and uh, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna shy away from why this is so hard, um, but let's just kind of talk through that. And there's, there's no comments so far. Oh yeah, the picture is a bit pixelated. Um, yeah, I don't know why it looks fine on mine, but I did get that from some others before. So let me know if you guys can't see this, and if not, I'll share my screen and I'll just try to do, draw it digitally. Um, I didn't bring my iPad, so it's gonna be a little bit harder for me to draw, but I can do it with my mouse. So if I bring this up, let's just see if you guys can even see this. So if I'm doing components and it doesn't help that my handwriting is horrible anyway can you guys read the word components with my horrible chicken chicken scratch <laughs> i'm going to assume we're going with a yes for now i'm going to keep drawing but if i have a sim we've got things from like the logs which is often syslog you know agents, and APIs. Oh, not even close. Wow, okay, so I can read it perfectly off my screen. StreamYard hates me. I must be really pixelated then. All right, we're gonna move to backup plan A because I don't have a backup plan, so we're just gonna call it that. So I'm gonna start with a Word document. Do, 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 do. When in doubt, just oh, let's not do that one. Let's do different different screen here. Do 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 this one. There we go. Okay. Different question. Can you even see my face? Do I look like me? <laughs> All right. Okay. So this is why I think most of the shy away. You guys can see the Word document. This is clear. Hopefully that's not pixelated. I'm assuming it's just something with my camera. Hey, Just. Yeah. Wondering if you could just um, white go full page width on that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, da, 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 dum, dum, dum. There you uh, go. That's perfect. 
Except for now, it's not letting me type. <laughs> there we go. Okay, beggars can't be choosers. You all chose to be here, so it's your fault when things don't work. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Justin. All right, Word, Word looks fine, right, Steven? It's just me that's pixelated. Can you confirm that for me, Steven? Yes, you are pixelated. We couldn't okay. see you. But Word is not. Word is not. Okay, all right. And David, we're not switching to Zoom. Come on, man. Come on. <laughs> all right. So we've got the logs we're trying to collect, and those come from agents, APIs, good old nasty syslog. And, well, okay, so really there's like 50-plus different formats, whether that's Ceph, you know, text, uh, leaf, you know, standard RFC 19, uh, not 19, 18, RFCs for syslog and so on. We send those into a, a aggregator that does the parsing, filtering, enriching. And then we've got the back end storage. But before we go there, we might do broker, which is also called a buffer. This could be something like Kafka, Redis, RabbitMQ, often is a multi node cluster or beefy piece of software. We'll just go with that, right? Because sometimes they're really complex, sometimes they're not. Then we've got our nice little analysis GUI. And technically we have more than that because I could and should look at integrating this with what threat intelligence systems, whether that's even something like open source MISP. We should be doing things like, um, how do I want to word this? We'll call this a uh, data science application. Whether you consider that statistical analysis, NLP, or whatever it is. And well, there's also incident management. Right. And then we also have, um, I'm missing one here, threat intelligence, incident management, and good old SOAR, security orchestration, automation, and response. And these are kind of, we'll call them the, uh, the main components of a well-deployed enterprise, enterprise grade SIM. That's a lot of components. And technically, if I break down like some of these, like here, that's a lot of different moving parts that can be configured entirely different. Linux, Windows, Mac, uh, appliances, especially the cloud APIs. Oof. Has anybody had to deal with some good cloud APIs for logging recently? You know what I'm talking about, that's painful. And technically, I'm leaving out things like scripting. Like I'm a big fan of doing Python or PowerShell against a sim, because um, that's where you might do things like, um, I use the Flare framework for command and control beginning identification. Some of you might be using Rita. Some have some built-in things into their sims like Exabeam or QRadar, like AQL statements and QRadar can do command and control identification. And how do I go about trying to learn and implement all of these to any degree of success at home? And as for the recording, yeah, this is usually recorded, I believe. I'll let Steven answer that one later, but I'm pretty sure this will be recorded and posted. So if you're interested in doing these, here's the problem. I want to learn these. I want to be able to do these for my day job, personally, because this is my day job. I love this stuff. Um, but for example, just let's just say from here to here, I've spent thousands of hours just on those components alone. And it's one of those things that's really interesting that when I, I first started going through it, like I even did formal training. like. Um, I've been to Splunk training. I've been to multiple of the Elastic Stacks training, like uh, for Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana, Beats, and but I still ended up having to learn how to do a lot of this on my own. And thousands of hours later, I'd say I'm now an expert. Now, expert doesn't mean I'm not constantly learning new things. It just means that. I can do this much quicker than I used to. But 
how do I go about learning this at home? And this is one of those things that the actual answer is, if everybody had to learn these from scratch, you absolutely should not be doing this. Well, not absolutely. You probably won't have the time to do this at home. So I, I love this because this is basically the concept of you, me, all of us coming together to push each other and pull each other up. You know, one of us has made it to the top of the mountain. What do we need to do? We need to reach down and help the other up. Because what we're starting to see, and I, I'm trying to help this, but I'm not the only one, is there, there's tons of ways we can go about doing this. For example, for those of you who just need a quick start, there's the, let's see if I can bring this up, this, right? Detection lab. Now you go through it, it's still a little confusing if you never deployed it at first because it's using projects like uh, Vagrant in here, supports multiple virtualization pl platforms, but basically it's an auto-deploying implementation for Microsoft ATA, Splunk, Windows Event Forwarding, Domain Controllers, and PowerShell Logging, and Sysmon, and Zeek, and Sturka, and there's a whole bunch of things, even with a HTML5 enabled guacamole to access the host directly. And basically you pick the virtualization you're using, even if it's cloud hosted and you launch this and it auto deploys your lab. So could anybody get a SIM up and running? Well, figure out how to get the, the Vagrant installed and running. They have documentation for this and it's up and running. The downside to this is this does so many cool things that they're abstracted and you didn't have to see how it's working. Like, yeah, and the, yeah, this is all free. Vagrant is free for use. This is all free. So the problem I have with this is if you want to be a consultant or you want to be a eng SIM engineer, and even if you want to be a SIM analyst, and you auto deploy all of this, you don't necessarily have a full understanding of all the moving parts. And so while I think this, this project, especially is something that uh, everybody in their career might try once, uh, and you might use it. This is great for demos. It's great for being able to blow it up and redeploy it. I kind of want you to reverse engineer it because you should know how to do Windows Event 40. There's lots of blogs on that. Like uh, one of my favorite is Windows Event Forwarding Elk Oh My. Even if you're not using the Elastic Stack, this is still a really, really good blog on deploying Windows Event Forwarding with group policies. And, and so what I'm kind of pushing you to do here is I want you to figure out each piece that someone else is automating, manually do it, and then down the road, fully automate and do all this if you want, but make sure you understand the individual components. Sysmon as a data source is one of the best data sources in the world. Like I can do all sorts of things with it and I can map it to MITRE and there's just some really cool stuff. So you might look at Olaf Hartong Sysmon. And so I'm, I'm basically giving you a lot of homework. <laughs> So, but this is kind of the, what I'm wanting you to do. I, I'm, I'm in the middle of actually deploying a demo tenant for our MSSP service, which is based on the Elastic Stack. And so I'm going from the ground up, I'm getting domain controllers deployed. I've got my hypervisors up and running and I'm trying to videotape them as I go. I've got a Hyper-V and a Proxmoc video that's done. I just need to a, a, a publish it. Procmon is fantastic, uh, by the way. Procmon, I, I tend to use more uh, ad hoc uh, rather than as a, a pure data source to assume, but that's still something I would definitely recommend getting comfortable with, especially the filters. So what we need to do is I would almost go back to this concept, and these are up to this point. Let's put a dotted line here. These are kind of like the starter pack. I want to start with getting these up, which first means I need to figure out what data I want. So what data I want. I want to start figuring that out because then just like what we want to send for, you should be collecting data sources that matter. So now I have to figure out how to get it over to your sim. 
Do you want to do that with Splunk free? Do you want to do the Elastic Stack open source edition, basic edition? Lately, I've been using the new uh, Amazon, which will be renamed from Open Distro to Open Search. It's still Elastic Stack, but it's going to be the open source version. And start deploying it and start to figure this out. A lot of the documentation for what I'm using references using Beats directly to Elasticsearch, but I don't like that. So I've chosen to go the route of data source to aggregator, which in my case is Logstash. If you're doing Splunk, well, then you're going to do this quite a bit differently, but you need to start researching this. And again, this is kind of why if I do the automation, like if I just go straight up Detection Lab, fantastic project, by the way, I'm not going to learn how to do those pieces because it's done for me. So what I want to do is maybe deploy this, see how it's working, and then in my lab, in your lab, start breaking this apart piece by piece. Start to do that research. And if you're not sure, email me. Uh, my email address, by the way, let's put it up here, justin at hasecuritysolutions.com. Feel free to email me. And I'll, I'll, I won't probably like spend time like giving you the, the answer to the T, but I'll point you in the right direction. Like, oh, you're trying to get logs from Docker. You've got AWS, you have Azure, you also have on-prem, and you've got all these different containers or Kubernetes. Go read this article, and it'll kind of describe what you're trying to do. Oh. So then we will start to solve that. So for like right now, I'm in the process of, I've got in my demo tenant, I've got Windows logs, I've got Suricata, I've got Zeek, uh, I've got my hypervisor logs. I'm gonna get ready to do ADFS, which is just Windows ADFS, so I can capture some XAML authentications. Um, but I need to integrate with Azure AD Connect. And then I need to start getting my Azure tenant logs through Azure Monitor. And so I, start by defining in my lab all these things I plan to do, and I start to stand these pieces up. I am going to be releasing videos specifically on how to deploy all of these components uh, using the Elastic Stack. At a later date, I might also do the same thing for Splunk, but I'm also not the only one out here doing this, so there's actually um, a lot of videos already out there for that. Uh, Ryan Kovar from Splunk, actually has some really good information. So I'm kind of talking through the steps we need to take to deploy a lab at home, but the answer really is, rather than trying to just solve everything on your own, try to find someone else who's already done the work and then use them as a, a template. Uh, the detection lab, it's kind of interesting. I, I monitor this project and it's kind of funny because I'm using the Elastic Stack, they're using Splunk. But what I'll do is I'll read through like Palantar, they're another good resource. They go over the top in depth on Windows Event 14. And I don't do everything they do, but I, I, I basically steal bits and pieces of what I think I really like and makes sense. And there are other documents out there of what to log, and I'll steal like the, you know, what makes sense out of those guides. And, you just keep going with this. This will break down like group policies specifically, very detailed, it'll go through auditing policies. And I mean, there's what to log from uh, uh, Mick Douglas and his crew. And so what I wanna do is find who do I wanna steal this information from? <laughs> I'm sharing some of the resources now, like what to log, Sysmon modular, the detection lab, uh, another project that I, I really, really like that I always follow out of here is signature, generic signatures. Because with this, I basically pull down about 600 automated alerts, detection techniques, but they'll work in Splunk, they'll work in Elastic, they'll work in QRadar. And so even when I get, oh, you know what? I didn't even put that in here. Alert engine. There's a lot of moving parts. So I basically go through how can I, I solve this the most? You know, Sigma generic signatures, right? 
This for me ends up being Cabana or Python. By the way, you can goofify some stuff with Python. I do this with a uh, Python and Flask. Uh, I'm I'm hopefully going to decommission Cabana down the road and have our own Flask app. Um, I tend to do this with Elasticsearch on the back end. I use Kafka for my brokering. So basically, I'm mapping these out. It would have been a lot prettier if I could have drawn it on the whiteboard, but uh, I'm too pixelated for that, so it's okay. Um, for those of us trying to break in as entry-level SOC analysts, Detection Lab would be great as is, correct? Yeah, so if, if you're purely only as an analyst, and, and yeah, that, that's a great question, then Detection Lab would probably be the, your best bet. It'll get it up and running. You'll have to have enough hardware, or you can sign up for like some Azure credits, which can be potentially even free for a certain time. And it's all there. And then at that point, you can actually start attacking your test machines. Like um, just as an example here, what you might play with as an analyst is you auto deploy your sim using the detection lab. And then you deploy Caldera from MITRE. Yeah, so Ludic, I'll come back to that one here in just a second. So I can deploy Caldera, which will allow me to deploy an agent on some of those test Windows boxes and launch known attacks against them that can also be rolled back. And then as an analyst, because your primary concern is you're trying to understand the data sources and how to catch what's going on. So you're staging things against it and going from there. So if you're in an analyst role, I wouldn't focus so much on reverse engineering the SIM components, but you need to understand the data sources very, very well, and then you need to try to attack and see the attacks within those data sources. Yeah, yeah. So what should I do with my PowerEdge R720? <laughs> you can deploy, so with the, the detection lab, you can deploy on-premise with VirtualBox. And it will auto spin things up on your PowerEdge R720. So I'm I'm at home. I because of my consultant role, um, I, my job as an MSSP is to catch adversaries. So I need to do analysts. But I like to customize the data I'm collecting. I'll do things like log enrichment. And so for that, I need to understand the components very in detail. Like uh, Ludic, uh, uh, apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. Like I put Kafka in. But in a home lab, you don't necessarily need Kafka because it's a buffer. Well, it's that's not technically true, but I mean, it is, but there's more to it than that. But with Kafka, what can happen is, let's say I'm changing my parsers or I'm changing enrichment components. Um, as an example, if I go to, got this out here. Going into here. Um, where did I put this? I think it's in the presentation. Yeah. So I've got a lot of my pre-saved um, presentations I've done. Like I'll go through here, and this was on a webcast I did with uh, log parsing and enrichment. And I started off with two alerts. Basically, one. I'll zoom that in just a little bit. One was a simple someone downloaded a file or DLL. Someone downloaded a PDF with some weird hex ASCII. And one of these is benign, and one of these is malicious. And right now in their current state, you can't tell. So what I do through this webcast and what I'll do in my lab and with uh, Logstash is I go through and I start to parse it out and enrich the data. So as an example, here's regex parsing. Here's, oh, that's not the right file. Let's go back. Do, 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 do. There we go. Parsing, oh, this is where I'm breaking it down. I want the full enrichment scenario. Here it is. Parsing, tagging, changing some of the field cases, adding a severity of high, medium, low, because it's easier than one, two, three. People flip the number sometimes. Geo lookups. I'm doing uh, REST APIs to pull in and, uh, natural language processing scores and uh, memcache integrations and all sorts of things. But if I change this file in production, 
it has to reload the pipeline. It takes, I don't know, 30 seconds. But if I'm dealing with, uh, let's say, Palo Alto, FortiGate, Checkpoint, SonicWall, uh, I'm doing syslog UDP for Linux systems, then what happens is during that 30-second reload, I'm losing logs because they got sent to the aggregator, but the aggregator is in a reload, and you're losing logs. So what I can do is I can bring in things off the wire and drop them into Kafka and then pull the logs out of Kafka when I'm ready. That way, if I were to update this really long config and it did a pipeline reload, it would first finish processing the logs it had, then pipeline reload, and then start pulling back from Kafka again. So Kafka, Redis, RabMQ, there's a few other ones out there, Kinesis up in Amazon, Event Hubs, Storage Blobs in uh, Azure. Then they allow you to have some more fault tolerance and uh, they deal with that log loss. So don't have to have it. I like it. There's also some other advantages, like um, has anybody heard of the Help Project by Roberto Rodriguez? Anybody like, yeah, we're, yep. That's another kind of uh, automated sim deployment, this one using the Elastic Stack. This is another one I, I sometimes will reverse engineer some of the things he's doing because he's using Kafka as a buffer, but he's also using it with a KSQL interface, which will let you do queries in, in some sense, some of the like data science applications directly against data in Kafka. Because Kafka tends to be more of time-based like just because you pull the log out of the buffer doesn't mean the log's not still there. It actually keeps it for a certain amount of time. So you might have three, seven days worth of data and you can query it, but it's not in a parsed state yet. Usually not. And so then again, pulls through Logstash, stores it in the back end, but he's using Apache Spark for machine learning jobs which is kind of interesting. Like right now I'm using um, open distro with some customizations. There's machine learning built into that, but it's not as flexible as like being able to run Spark or really just running Python directly against Elasticsearch. And so you can bolt on, which is what Roberto here is showing and use things like Jupyter notebooks, graph frames and, now all of a sudden you're getting machine learning and graphing capabilities that they're often associated with a, a platinum license, which is like $6,000 per node. You know, granted, you get a little bit of discount on that, but yeah. So now all of a sudden with this project, you run a simple install script. It'll start asking you questions, get some sizing on it, clone it, run the Helk install, and then poof, now you have another sim up and running. The fun thing here is I could run Detection Lab, Splunk, and I could run the Helk install and use that, and now I have an Elastic Stack. And in a lab, I can now be dual simming it. And there's some fun stuff we could do with this then, because now I'm basically running two install scripts that someone else wrote. As long as I have enough hardware, I've got Splunk and Elastic. And I can then get the same data and try to fork it into both sims. And that's pretty common within businesses as well. And so I can do that. And I can try to design that because like, um, man, I wish I had my whiteboard working here. Uh, I'm going to switch to, I'm going to do this in Excel because I can't draw very well with my mouse. So let me show you this. I'm opening Excel right now. I'm going to give it to the other monitor. Like, let's just as an example say we have a, a Windows posts. I'm going to increase the size of this. There we go. And I've got uh, DCO1, DCO2, you know, computer one, oop, computer, oh wow, I can't type. Computer one, computer two, computer three, and so on. All right, and we've got multiple hosts. The problem is, you in your lab, or many of us in our employers, you've got more than one sim, right? And even as an analyst, this is this is problematic because the way you search in Splunk is not the way you would search in, you know, QRadar, Logarithm, Elasticstack. And so I, I've kind of got to learn a little bit of both of these. But 
how do I get the logs to both? Any, any thoughts on how you would address this? So I'm, I'm pulling the audience here. How would you try to get logs from these assets to both of these SIPs? What do you think? Some of you are like, uh, the way we do this today is we send these two to Splunk and these three to Elastic. <laughs> Open source log magic, Scott. Yes, I like it. File beats. So if you're doing Elastic, you're probably doing WinLogB. So what I could do is I can install an agent, which means I would install on each one of these assets WinLogB. And for those of you who are Splunk users, how well are you going to like the data if I say WinLogBeat and I try to point it over to Splunk? Can I do WinLogBeat to Splunk? WinLogBeat will let me go direct to Kafka, which I could pull from Kafka to Splunk. I can go direct to Logstash, which is not Splunk. And I can go direct to Elasticsearch. So the Beats framework's not going to work for Splunk. So at this point, we've enabled Elastic, but Splunk's not going to work. Put PubSub in between, that, that could potentially work. You can have the aggregator forward to both. OK, so in here, we're adding in the aggregator. I'm going to go back to this. So in this case, I like to use Logstash. I could do Logstash to both Splunk and Elastic. Diego, I'm going to come right back to you, too, on that one, because that, 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 that's the correct answer, too. All right, how about, what's the issue, though, if I go from these five machines via WinLogBeat to Logstash to Splunk. Is anybody, anybody familiar with what issue we just caused? Because you can do this, and it will work with Splunk. This won't work well. Technically, I can Logstash to every sim. But there's an issue that we're creating here. Does anybody know why going from WinLogBeat to Logstash to Splunk might be problematic? And Splunk is actually one of the sims that this is the least issue with. If I were to do like QRadar, this would be more of a, uh, a problem. It's not the fact that it's JSON, because Splunk has zero issue with JSON. Splunk is fine with JSON. The issue is WinLogBeat, the agent, will format the field names according to the elastic common schema naming convention. Which means if I'm using default Splunk rules, not log duplication, if I'm doing a rules from Splunk or different sites I'm finding that are from Splunk users, the field names they're going to reference probably won't match what's going to come in via JSON. Could you just change the field names? Yeah, sure. In Splunk, that's no problem. We can do aliases. And like, I can make it work. If that was QRadar or some of the other ones, that's even more problematic. So if I want to be able to have like all my alerts work with the naming convention from Splunk, that's a problem. All right, so we can take a different approach. I could eliminate the aggregator, or maybe we still have it, but that's for win log beat to log stash. Oh, I need to do the uh, make this text. I could do to log stash to elastic, kind of as this approach. But then what I'm going to do for Splunk is each of these is actually also going to run a universal order. One log beat universal forward. Basically, each one is running dual agents. Splunk with JSON, there's no parsing with JSON. The fact that you're getting the data is not a problem at all. It's just that the field names by default won't match the Splunk field name convention, which is not that big of a deal for Splunk. For other ones, it's a bigger issue. So in this case, what I could do is DC01 does universal forwarder to Splunk. And then DC01 does win log beat to log stash to elastic. That, that's totally going to work. Both of them are going to get the fields the exact way they expect to see them, naming convention, you name it. 
What's the problem with the dual agent rule, though? Uh, I guess, actually, is there even a point asking this question? How many of you would be comfortable going back to your employer and be like, we need to install two log agents on all of our assets? Because I don't know about you, but getting one is hard. <laughs> so if I want everything to work native to the sim, Splunk and Elastic, that would work. But it's probably not going to happen. So what most likely is going to happen, and this is why you'll see the detection lab, I think Roberto's help does the same thing. And even in my demo tenant that I'm doing, I'm doing the same thing. These hosts get no agents. Instead, what ends up happening is I'll stand up a, another box. And I'll call this the Windows Event Collector. You might be, have more than one of these, but might have a handful. And so I'll just call this WEC. Uh, in my demo environment, my home lab, I just have one WEC server. And so what happens is each one of these boxes sends their logs natively with Windows Event Forwarding controlled via GPO to a WEC. And then on that WEC system, dual agent install. Because it's a dedicated logging server, and I could have you know 5,000 devices all pointed to one WEC, and instead of installing two agents on 5,000 devices, I install two agents on one asset, the WEC. And so this is the stuff like as you're kind of playing with this lab, you start to learn like, well, when I tried to do win log beat the log stash to Splunk, I could totally get the data there, but when I started to use the built-in rules, they didn't work and I had to go through and rename all the fields. But now if I did this, I could go to, well, there's also Q Radar Community Edition. So for a home lab, I can deploy all three of these. Now with this design, I just changed this to a triple agent install. And now all three sims get the logs exactly the way they expect them. Q radar would be WinCollect, which is syslog based. Done. And this works with Sysmon, by the way, because that Sysmon was also mentioned, and Sysmon is absolutely fantastic. Highly recommend. And so you can do the analysis in each of these the way you want. I can get the logs the way I want, and we're done. This is very Windows specific, by the way. So then again, same thing as you're playing with a home lab. Let's say I have an Apache 01, Apache 02, Nginx 01, so on, right? These are probably Linux systems. You do the same exercise. But what you'll learn is, and this is the reason why I'm always a fan of a lab, is the Apache logs themselves are the same whether it's on Ubuntu, CentOS, or Windows. You're just grabbing files, picking them up, and then dropping them off at the SIP. You can change the format. Like, I can have Apache and Nginx log in JSON format, and I like doing that personally. But if I were to just take the default, like, CSV-style logs, the combined log format, right? And here, it's like... Something like uh, var log Apache 2 you know, access.log, right? Well, if I'm sending that again to Splunk, yeah, Azure, and I, yeah, Azure Sentinel is a sim, not anything we can play with, uh, I'm good with. So Splunk, Elastic, I'll do Azure Sentinel over here for you, right? <laughs> For the most part, it doesn't matter how I pick up the log so long as these understand it. So I could do, for example, in this case, and again, I'm not recommending this. I'm just saying it's an option. Like I can do NX log and have it read the log and send it directly to Splunk, send it directly to Elastic. Sentinel, you have to use a little bit of some of their like relay system, but I can still do that because I'm just dealing with files. So going then to the question of what about Linux? Well, on these same systems, because these are Linux, let's say it's CentOS or Ubuntu, 
I'll have stuff like var log uh, off dot log. I'll have var log kern dot log, and in order to catch certain type of attacks, I want this. Yeah, five log five giga logs for Azure Sentinel for free. Yeah, throw it in there, try it out. That's totally fine. Uh, and Azure Sentinel will take Azure monitoring a lot easier than some of these others, even Splunk or Elastic, because it's Azure to Azure. Uh, it'll be a little bit more work for some of the other ones, but Azure Sentinel's got a lot going for it. It's still pretty pretty cool. So remember, with Linux systems, you're dealing with, again, files. Now, I mentioned NX log. I could technically use something like FileBeat. Or how about this? Syslog ng, rsyslog, syslog b. The syslog daemons built into them. At the end of the day, when you're dealing with these style of logs, all you're really doing is picking them up and then throwing them over to your sim. So I could effectively use any of these options to try to send it over to the sim. And as long as it can receive, like, TCP, UDP, and they all can. For Linux, the endpoint method can be whatever. So remember up top, I did a Windows event collector because I didn't want to deploy agents on all of these. If I want to do the same stance, Scott, I know he's on here, so we just did this with Scott. I don't have to deploy FileBee on all these assets. We can just use this log ng or whatever's already on the boxes. Because you're just saying, hey, grab the logs, forward them off, and done. The only difference is you need it to be somewhere that can catch it that can potentially buffer. Like Splunk, Elastic, depending on how you're receiving them, there's not a buffer. Syslog, UDP, mm, system was down, oops, didn't know you lost logs. TCP, Syslog NG and our Syslog by default, they'll try to connect to Splunk the Azure connector, Elastic, and, oh, there's nothing there on the other side of this TCP. Don't read the log yet. Oh, it's now online now? Okay, here's where I last left off, and they self-bookmark. So as long as I'm doing a TCP-based transport, I don't need a buffer in that mix because all of these solutions we just talked about would self-buffer. It's your switches, your firewalls, your wireless access points, your hypervisors <laughs> that don't self-buffer very well. So this is this is why I like the lab stuff so much, and that's really what we should be playing with, with with our work environments too, is what's the challenge? What am I trying to solve? Do I have to have more than one SIM supported and you go from there? Because then on the same token, if we assume the data is now at the backend SIM, let's say you're trying to say something like alert, you know, 50 failed logins in, you know, I don't know, 30 minutes. I don't care. And you're trying to alert on that. Well, Splunk, Elasticstack, QRadar, Azure Sentinel, you might have to have a different rule for every single one of them because the field naming convention is different per product. So that's where I go back to, I really like the Sigma project, which is uh, this one, Sigma. Because in here, it helps me solve that. I write a rule in one format, and then I just convert it to the different SIM solutions. And now I have the same rule that works across all of them. The format's YAML, it's not the prettiest thing in the world, but, and then on top of that, Sorry, I'm scrolling so fast. By the way, here's some of the targets supported. I also can use the Sigma to attack against the rules that I'm defining, and it builds a heat map that I can track my coverage. So it, it solves multiple things for me, and my favorite thing is it's full of rules. Even like cloud, here's some AWS stuff. I, I didn't write those, they're just there by default. That brute force rule, it's probably already in here somewhere, like against some of the built-in logs. I'm just going to open one of these up. And so we can see stuff like here's like taxi references and MITRE attack techniques covered. 
it's a universal rule that will convert and work across all the platforms. So that means if I, instead of writing a custom rule for each of these, I instead just put in a signal rule. Get in for Sentinel 2 because Sentinel is supported. Now, if let's say I'm on Splunk, but I want to switch to Sentinel, or I'm on Sentinel and I want to switch to Elastic Stack, I'm on Elastic Stack, I want to switch to Q Radar, your rules will move with you. Meaning your architecture was designed in a way that you're 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 not vendor locked in. You already have the right data sources. Again, new vendor. If you did Windows event forwarding and collection, you would just drop the new vendor's agent and you're done. Linux systems were always just files anyway. So as long as you bring it in and it gets parsed correctly, your rules will continue to work. This is the stuff I like with the labs because now I could have detection lab, I could have Helk. Uh, I'll come out with a video, um, I don't know, probably in the next month or two that will walk through how to do a custom uh, open distro-based sim um, with no limitations, multi-tenant, SAML off. I'll probably integrate it with like Azure for MFA and all the Azure and AWS monitoring as well. Um, but that will probably be a month or two out. But I'll walk you through that. And what you want to kind of get in the lab, if you're truly going to walk through it all, is as an analyst, I'm analyzing the data regardless of the SIM. Shouldn't matter. Data is data, right? But is it? Because <laughs> all the enrichment stuff that you can do for really any of these SIMs, it's not on by default. So as an analyst, I need to understand what I need to do my job. So if I say, oh, I have a DNS log, but I need to know when it was registered with who is, uh, if it's a potentially randomly generated domain, like a DGA, uh, the length of the domain, like I need all these different things. The data is the same, but those enrichments need to be added, whether it's at a SOAR, at the SIM, both ideally. And so you need to understand the data enough to pass it to the engineers to be like, hey, could you give me this? As engineers, we need to figure out what's the best way to get the data from the data sources to the SIM and how we can do the alerts against it without wasting our time if we ever change. So, yeah. I'm totally glossing over how hard this actually is to start going through it, but start with the detection lab, start with Helk, and again, I'm gonna do a, a, a walkthrough by walkthrough doing like an elastic stack of the future, uh, and we can do that next. A week from next week, because I'm teaching next week, I'm also going to do a introduction to Docker. So if, if some of you are unfamiliar with containers, how they work, how they log, uh, that's going to be a technical dive. We'll actually walk through just nonstop demo because I had someone who that doesn't understand Docker or containers the way they should. And so I'm just going to do a, a quick uh, deep dive on them for them. A quick start, we'll call that a jump start, right? And I'm hoping to keep doing some of these type of things. So I guess since they're here, I know I think I did this the last talk we did. But the other piece in your home lab that I want you to try to slowly build to, Think of this session more of the, this is the checklist of the things I want you to be aware of. And then in future sessions, I'll try to go through, here's how you actually do it. <laughs> I also, and I know as a consultant how helpful this is. Oh, I, doo -doo -doo. I also want to go through and do MITRE mappings. So what that means is I want my SIM infrastructure to spit out information. Like, uh, for example, here we go. Hopefully, this still works with the newest version. If not, I'll just go an older one. This would be like if I did the default Windows domain audit policies. Purple is good. We want purple. When there's no color, means that I don't have that data source. So what I'm doing here is I'm building on MITRE detect right here. And it's a visual editor. I'm just going to bring up the, the web page for this. It is here. 
And I'm going through and I map out my data sources. Add data sources. You can start typing letters and see like Active Directory stuff. And well, by default, just like with Windows installed, you've got some good logs, like log on monitoring. You can still do some of that, but um, eh. So what I need to do is figure out what data sources matter and why you keep hearing me plus others in chat say Sysmon. EDR would also give you this as well. Is if I just add Sysmon to this mix, that's the only thing I add. Native Windows, Windows Sysmon. Now I can talk to management and I can justify why I need certain things. But there's another problem I'm not solving here. Basically what I did in this diagram is I'm figuring out what assets and what data on those assets. So these are Windows boxes. All I said was Windows plus Sysmon gave me this coverage. Yeah. That's really good coverage and it, it honestly is. But coverage without rules, like automated detection techniques, um, machine learning, anomaly detection, like I don't care what it is, but without something to help, okay, within these data sources, we found this bad thing happen, Analysts go fish. Are you expecting your analysts to manually dive through all this data? Yeah, that's threat hunting. Okay, threat hunting is great. You should do it, but you can't do it real time all the time, and you shouldn't. Well, it'd be cool if you could, but we can't. It's not practical. So I need to use things like Sigma again, which has these miter tacking, uh, miter mappings, and in there. I can generate with that sigma to attack another heat map. But that one looks a little different. It looks like this. So now I have what I can see, potentially see, and I have automated rules against these boxes. And then I can go in and be like, OK, well, show me where I have an automated alert, but I don't have data. I think I, oh, no, okay, I know what this is. False, false, I need to right click, uh, select annotated. I do this every time I do this demo. Set a score of one, go to the next one, right click, select annotated, set a score one, hover, make sure it's there, it is, now it'll work. Uh, create layers, same thing, and boom. There we go, okay. So here where you're seeing blue, this is embarrassing. This means that I have automated rules that will find evil, but there's no data for the rule to run against. <laughs> I wrote this cool rule, but it, it's never going to fire because there's no data. Oops. Well, the reverse of that is where I have data, but I don't have automated alerts. Notice I got quite a few more of those. So these might be areas where I need to put some automated alerts, or hopefully I do have threat hunting against it. So now notice this whole sim architecture in this lab is it's designed to help me figure out gaps, understand if I even care, and I keep taking it farther and farther into building this out. I'm, I'm learning the architecture, I'm finding the faults, and and going from there. Yeah, and this yeah this is not going to be immediate. You're definitely going to learn over time, and yeah. So we've got six minutes left. Uh, I've pointed out a few resources for helping auto-deploy a home lab. So it can bring it to anybody's fingertips, right? It would be great for you to try to bring in even things like um, some of your smart home devices. If you can get logs off of those, it's just fun. I currently play with Home Assistant. Home Assistant's really cool. And you can get the logs from that and stream it to one of these, these uh, um, home lab type things or Azure Sentinel, I don't care. Can I share all these links, please? Oh, um, do, 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 do. let's see here. Steven, if I put these in private chat, can you move them to general comments? Because I still, for whatever reason, don't have access to that. I'm going to put them there, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to force uh, Steven here to put them in general chat. <laughs> And yes, I'll start sharing these. You could do. So again, I guess I'm just kind of summary where I'm going with this. I would personally like to see you auto deploy and just play with home sim. If you're going to be in an engineer or consultant role, I think you should reverse engineer it. 
And if you're an analyst, well, then just start playing with it and throwing attacks against it. Uh, that was using things like um, Albera. And there's also Atomic Red. The reason I didn't reference that one earlier is Caldera is kind of auto-deployed as well as Infection Monkey. I you know that sounds funny, but uh, yes, that is that. These will let you deploy an agent. It will auto-launch attacks for you, and you can roll them back, and they map to MITRE techniques so you can figure out what's going on. So did you do this one? When is container session? So that one is not, I, mean, I guess even we can make the container one a live stream if you're available. Not next week, but the week after sometime that week, I'm gonna do a one hour session on learning containers. It can be SANS or I'll just do it individually. So Steven will offline that one. I will post that on my Twitter. I'm security mapper underneath my name. So if you find that you're interested in that container where I'm going to walk through setting it up, um, just monitor my Twitter account, and I'll post when that event's going to be. It'll be the week after next week. All of this can be done on a PowerEdge R720 so long as you have enough CPU and RAM, which I'm going to guess even if you bought it used off eBay, it probably has enough RAM. Yep. And again, in the future, probably in the next month or two, I'm going to do a from scratch, start to finish walkthrough uh, of how to do like a, an open source sim, but very manual hands on rather than an auto deploy. So. And if you're referring to the page where I list a lot of tech systems, you're probably talking about a YouTube video where I'm talking about lab hardware. Keep in mind, even though I'm going through all these different pieces of hardware that you have for your lab, you don't need to have those. Those are just possible suggestions. At the end of the day, all you really actually need is a desktop or laptop with enough RAM, and you could deploy all of this. So you don't even have to buy anything so long as you have enough RAM and CPU. Yeah. My internet connection's uh, very fine. Uh, I don't know why I'm pixelated on my side where I'm seeing the webcam. I'm not pixelated at all. Uh, previous ones, I haven't been pixelated, so I don't know what's going on. I mean, I, I can get one gig plus on my internet pipe. I'm just assuming that for whatever reason, when I connected to StreamYard this time, there's something weird. Uh, I'll try to get that fixed and see what's going on with that. So, yeah, so David, you'll be fine. Yep, VirtualBox, VMware Workstation, something like that, and off to the races you go. All right. Well, with that, I hope this was helpful. Uh, again, stay tuned for the post for the upcoming container one, as well as I've got multiple of these coming out as well. Uh, I hope this was helpful. And I hope you have a great weekend. And we'll go from there. Oh, yeah, I, I've got this all-around Defender series uh, about budgeting. This is for all things blue team. Uh, whether you have a lot of money or you don't have much money, whether it's OPEX or it's CAPEX, it's just going to be a budget discussion of what would you do if you had X amount of dollars? Uh, the free Splunk, I'm not, I don't remember. I just know in my lab, when I start sending a few domain controllers to it, the free runs out of license. Um, so that's why I'm doing more of an uh, open source one. So. so there's some course that teaches how to set up SIM correctly. Uh, 555 SIM with tactical analytics. I guess I should promote my own class. Um, but I just assume you all know that, so. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend, uh, and we'll go from there. <laughs>